Top Med Talk. Well, hello and welcome to Top Med Talk. We are coming to you live from Ed Pump 2019 here at the British Museum in London, England. I'm Desiree Chapel, host and managing editor of Top Med Talk, and I'm joined by our editor in chief, Monty Mylan. Hello, Monty. Hey, Desiree. Good to be here. Yeah, doing a great day so far. Great day so far. They are working us hard today, and I just picked up the next session as well. (laughs) Did you? We're also being, uh, you know, the British Museum have been really helpful. Yeah. All I can say, the food is good. The food has been very nice, yes. Uh, And uh, But lots of good buzz. We've had lots of excitement going on in between the sessions and talking out here in the exhibition area. Brilliant. So, yeah, all good stuff. So um, the, this actual meeting is a collaboration with the uh, World Congress, the Prehabilitation World Congress, POETS, which is the Perioperative Testing and Training Society. Boom, I got it. <laughs> no, you didn't. No, you didn't. I didn't. Perioperative exercise. exercise. Oh, damn it. I didn't you've get it. Got, Sorry, you've guys. Got about three more goes to get it right. <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting good advertising. R- write it down. Uh, try, I do, actually, right here. On uh, Tripom, the trainees in perioperative medicine. So it really is a collaborative meeting that speaks to um, pe- the perioperative medicine mission. Absolutely. So um, the, today, this session uh, is actually uh, sponsored by Edwards Life Sciences. We yeah. want to say thank you very much uh, to them for to them. supporting uh, uh, free open access medical education, right? for the masses. Um, I want to thank our guests that we have here uh, with us that are joining us. We have Simon Davies uh, from York Teaching Hospital here in the UK, and we have uh, Faraz Hatib from Edwards Life Sciences. Hello, gentlemen. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. That's right. Always good to see you. Thank you, Monty. <laughs> thank you. And Faraz, we, you've been a, a friend of Top Med Talk for yes, a while. Yes, and uh, very nice to be here again. Yeah, <laughs> we just had a, a dinner the other night on Tuesday night. All right. Very well. Yeah. It's good time. We, we've, done, we've done a few gigs now, haven't we? We did yeah, one did. Anesthesia 2019. We did one above a pub uh, near St. Paul's. We had a great turnout, wonderful evening there. Mm-hmm. And just the, uh, the other night, we did one in the Montague Hotel over the road, live streaming it. Yeah. Questions coming flooding in. It was great fun. Yeah. Both these guys are Top Men Talk regulars, really. Though. They are. Simon's been around <laughs> a couple well, of times. Well, I've been too. pressed around into quite a few of them now. <laughs> oh, come on. You know, it's a ton no, of fun. I love it. It's great fun. <laughs> great, great fun. Uh, so, Simon, you're going to be presenting uh, later today during during the main session. And uh, we're going to be doing a little Top Med talking uh, from the stage. But can you tell us a little bit about what your uh, topics are and, and what you're going to be discussing from the stage? Uh, well, Tim's going to start off with hypotension and how that affects uh, patient outcomes. Uh, and that then naturally leads on to what do we do? You know, how do we avoid it or how do we treat it? And it's really just a few ideas that I've had about where we can improve our care. And some of them are quite simple, just change of behavior maybe better monitoring in terms of how frequently we measure blood pressure. And then there's slightly more exciting things, how we adopt technology. So the use of predictive analytics, which is why, you know, for us is uh, very heavily involved in that. And also maybe have a look at some closed loop systems, taking management of blood pressure out of our hands and, and automate it because time and time again, automation performs much, much better than we do. Yeah, and I'd love to dive in. I want to dive into that more. Um, Simon, give us a little bit about your background. Where are you from and what have you... Uh, where have you I'm, been I'm from on? the rainy north of England. Yeah. Um, so Yorkshire, northeast of England. A uh, very, very beautiful city, old uh, Roman wall city. Um, and we're famed for our minster and our <laughs> Roman walls and... You know, sort of glorious countryside, although Monty kept beating me last time with uh, pictures of Dingle, so I'm, I'm a bit peeved about that. Um, and I've been there for, well, as a consultant for about 10 years, um, but I did quite a bit of my training up there as well, and a uh, really good group of people, very proactive, um, very clinically orientated in terms of research, and yeah, great bunch of guys to work with, and, and quite research active. And you've oh, been really focused on... Um Hypotension and, and uh, hemodynamic management in practice there and looking at that? I mean, for many years, um, looking at hemodynamics as well as other outputs. But, I mean, even for me, hypotension's really only just come on the radar in the last two or three years. Yep. Um, and I'm only just realizing the importance of hypotension and the avoidance of it in terms of, you know, how our patients do after surgery. Yeah. I was going to say that you, your, uh, some of your older colleagues, if you care what I say here, Jonathan Wilson in particular. He's just retired, so you can call him out. Okay, <laughs> d- d- well done. Congratulations, Jonathan. <laughs> David Yates. Is if we go back to Jonathan's original papers, he was right at the very early stages of so-called goal-directed therapy. And if I remember correctly, his very early study was with a pulmonary artery catheter to do goal-directed therapy, which it worked was. fine and dandy, didn't it? It worked yep. well. 
But we see the evolution from there, haven't we? And that was probably the mainstay of monitoring that we had in terms of advanced hemodynamics at that stage. Um, but as the decades have progressed, we've, we've gone to more non-invasive or minimally invasive technology and, and reaped the same benefits. Different protocols, different ways of delivering care, but the underlying principle still being the same. So where are you currently with regards to, for the more major cases where you're using advanced hemodynamic monitoring, cardiac output monitoring, are you working off the arterial line more now? Yeah, so most of our, most of our monitoring now for our medium to high risk patients is arterial based with the flow track plus or minus some HPI uh, work we're doing as well now. And before we get into the blood pressure thing, the core principles that you've adhered to over time, so fixing uh, you know, volume flow and we'll come to pressure in a second, but that sort of, we call it goal-directed approach, is still at the heart of things. I think so. I mean, it makes common sense. And I think what we often forget is, is fluid's a drug. You know, yeah. It has positive effects and it has negative effects. And if we're giving it blindly, if we're not monitoring what happens when we give it, how do we know it's working? How is it benefiting that patient? So more recently, your journey has been, as we'll be hearing about, in blood pressure. But in particular, I think you're one of the relatively small group of people who got early access to what's called HPI. You can explain that to us between both you and Faras in a second. Uh, and, and you've you know, started off, I think, as a bit of a skeptic and have become, like myself, a convert. <laughs> time. But, yeah. Tell us a bit more yeah. about that. Your journey. We, we were very fortunate. <laughs> we, we, we've worked with Edwards off and on, um, you know, initially through Jonathan and then through myself for about a decade now. And they came to us maybe, it must be almost three years ago now, that this new piece of technology, it predicts hypotension before it happens. Have a look and see what you think. And, and Dave was involved, Dave Bates as well. And we played around for about five cases or so and just thought, I don't need technology to tell me what to do. I can see that blood pressure dropping. I do not need a number to tell me that patient will be hypotensive. And we all rolled our eyes and we wandered off, so it's just nonsense. <laughs> and then it was probably about, you know, oh, maybe a few weeks into it and we were still using it, a bit less so because we, were, we weren't really believers. And there was that moment when it, the blood pressure was 80, mean arterial. HPI was saying you're going to be hypotensive and you think this is just nonsense. And then they were. I thought, ah, oh, this might have some mileage, actually. So re- we've recorded a bit about this recently, but just to remind people, the HPI number is from 0 to 100. It's on the monitoring screen, so it looks like a physiological variable. But as it rises, correct me if I'm wrong, the chance of the blood pressure dropping to a dangerous level is sometime in the next 15 minutes, yep. depending on... So, you know, and, and it... When you get up to 85, it's saying there's a very, very high likelihood the patient will become dangerously hypotensive soon. Yeah, so the higher the number, the more likely you are to have that dangerous hypotension. And when it happens, it'll happen quite shortly. But it does predict it out up to 15 minutes. But the higher the number, the quicker it tends to happen. And you started off as a skeptic, but your recent publication between your institution <laughs> and Groningen, yep. Thomas Sheeran, for example, who appears on one of the screens here, your conclusion at the end of that was that you think it works. It works better. Well, A, it works, and it works better than anything else we measure, which, which kind of makes sense. When we looked at all sorts of different things, changes in stroke volume, heart rate, SVV, SVR, and none of them predict hypotension or impending hypertension, and neither does change in blood pressure. Mm. It kind of makes sense when we think about it because they're all very unidimensional. We're just focused on one thing, whereas HPI, and I'm sure for us to explain it in a bit, takes you know, 26 different parameters, many of which are combinatorial factors. So it's looking at this multidimensional model of, of hypotension. And so it makes sense it works better. Because mm-hmm. we, we've been in, also in highly controlled, um, relatively late to the party, highly controlled laboratory environments. And, you know, where we can see that there is hemorrhage, for example, and the number is changing consistent with the hemorrhage. And if you couldn't see the hemorrhage, everything else looks perfect on the screen. Yeah. So, so for us, perhaps you could tell us just quickly about how it's derived and, and what is it that the machine can do that we can't see? Uh, yes, so basically uh, HPI uh, tries to detect the failure of the compensatory mechanisms that maintain blood pressure stable. So uh, to maintain blood pressure stable, physiologically, there is a contrabalance between preload, afterload, and contractility, right? That contrabalance each other uh, to maintain blood pressure stable, and that those contrabalance uh, mechanisms create very complex uh, 
relationships and dynamic links and physiological associations between different uh, uh, physiological or cardiovascular uh, variables. Uh, so uh, the, the, the HPI algorithm uh, uh, takes the arterial pressure waveform and uh, measures out of the arterial pressure waveform measures um, uh, parameters related to preload, to afterload, to contractility, to aortic impedance, etc. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, it, it detects with machine learning, with artificial intelligence techniques, detects those complex multidimensional associations between all these uh, 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 hemodynamic variables uh, to detect early, uh, you know, failure in the compensatory mechanisms that lead to hypotension. So this is basically the high-level um, algorithm de description. As I understand from our previous recordings, we've got you can. Those of you who haven't heard it yet, you can look on Top Med Talk. You can look up HPI. There's a number of different versions of this recorded. You, based on thousands of patients, you took millions of yeah. variables. Right. And, and use supercomputing, let's call it that, machine learning, artificial intelligence, yeah. distill down the number of things that inform the equation. Yes. And then the machine turns around and says, it might look all right to you, but there's a 35 out of 100 chance that this person will become hypotensive down the line. And, and that changes. Simon, give us, give us a bit more context for all of that, because you've used it a lot now. Yeah, I think you're right there to highlight the sheer scale of it. Mm. You're looking at 2.6 million features from a single waveform and then applying that to 150 million waveforms all which you have data about hypertension not hypertensive I mean that's beyond the scope to what we can comprehend so it's really looking for those you know, those absolute factors that predict hypertension the best and then your question was um, what does the number do how do we use it I think it's interesting I think we have to look beyond it being a predictor of hypertension and it is a warning of cardiovascular instability. Hypertension is the end point, but the cause of it underlying, that's what it's warning you on. And that goes back to your point. We see subtle changes in HPI before we see any change on macro hemodynamics. It's in a highly controlled environment yep. where we've been able to control hemorrhage, for example, in, in models. Yep. That, that, the, that, that very early hemorrhage was detectable by the HPI rising in a way that you look at the main screen up there, if you hadn't taken the trouble to notice the swabs in the bucket, you wouldn't be informed by it. Very, very yeah. subtle uh, In the same experiments in the physiological model, but we saw almost half a litre of blood loss before yeah. we got changes in the things we commonly measure. Uh, and that's a bit of a worry, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think that's known physiology. It's just not commonly known physiology. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's a very, very important point. Now, it's, it's approved. So, I mean, one of the reasons it's attracted attention, we're talking a lot about it, is it's the first, as far as I know, piece of artificial intelligence in our space. There's other AI approved out there in our space that has been approved in Europe for coming up to on two years now, is it? Oh, I'm not sure Europe's 18 months to, to two years. Um, but you're right, it's the first foray for anaesthesia into predictive analytics. It won't be our last by any yeah. means. And in the USA, it was approved, I think, about last October. Yeah. In the operating room and the intensive care unit, Ferris? Uh, now in the, in the intensive care unit as well, recently. And recently we were hearing the other night in Europe, it's now approved for the, the, the clear sight the clear sight technology. Yeah. So the, yeah. the Finipress type of technology evolved into clear sight, which is a finger device that yes. doesn't require an arterial one. Yes. So Simon, have right. you been using the, the clear sight one or you said mate, uh, mostly arterial? Uh, mostly arterial. We use some clear sight, but not with HPI, just as a, a measure of blood pressure. So okay. it's unique in this space. Now, as I said, we know, we know there's other AI being approved and this is a rapidly, rapidly developing field. Now, the reason I keep banging on about this is because we're lucky, Team Anesthesia, we're in early. Mm -hmm. What we're at risk of is screwing it up. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Lack of engagement, lack yeah. of belief. Uh, and this is a real problem, is that we've got a real opportunity to engage with this technology. It, it's going to benefit us in the long term, but more importantly, benefit our patients. Because to be fair, we don't know exactly what to do with it yet, do we? I, I think we're getting a better idea, but do we don't know? Absolutely no. No, we don't. Yeah. So we mustn't, we mustn't diss it too early. We must engage with it. We must learn by doing. Yeah. And we must travel that journey. Because we're pretty bad at this. We're pretty, you know, as a specialty, we often talk about this, is if you, if you ring up a cardiologist and you ask them a question about an intervention, they say, first of all, let me say, 
you know, ischemic heart disease is very important, then they give their opinion. <laughs> if you ring up a team anesthesia and say, what do you think 30 years ago about propofol? They'll say it's rubbish. Yeah. yeah. And then they'll, then they'll say, but anesthesia is important. So, sorry. Well, that, no, no, it's to that point uh, about adoption. And, and Simon, you can talk to this. Um, whenever you first brought it in, you said it was just a couple people, you know, you and another that were, you know, looking at it. How did you feel it was adopted throughout the rest of your department? And, and what do you guys... What were you doing to help with that adoption? We, we, we kept it quite small. Oh, so okay. just the guy, well, at the moment, just the guys doing the major surgery. Many of the reasons Monty says we're not quite sure how to best use it, and mm-hmm. therefore you want to control uh, access to it until you, you, know, you find out where you are on the playing field. Um, but once you get that core nucleus of enthusiasm yeah. and support, that's when it starts to spill. And a lot of it actually came from us not talking about HPI but saying, this is our data on hypotension in York, it's pretty bad. All you guys, and me included, are involved in anesthetizing these patients. This is a potential solution. Mm -hmm. Let's explore it, let's find out. And people engage with it. And HPI is interesting in terms of it being a warning, but also the information you get on different physiological parameters is is also quite useful in care. And, And to go back to physiological models, you and I have both seen that uh, my worry is with the focus on the hypotension we will just see a lot of vasopressor usage around the UK and around the world and we've both seen that how you can make things look absolutely normal in terms of stroke volume cardiac output and you can absolutely destroy your circulation at an organ level all looks fine but underneath the bonnet it's all going wrong so volume flow pressure volume flow pressure and that's what you'll be going into in great detail in your lecture which will record and live transmit from the stage but also record but it's got to always be volume flow pressure. And that's what the so-called secondary screen, the decision support, I think adds to the equation. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask for us about, the secondary screen and, and how it's utilizing that information and then helping us make decisions. Yes, yeah, so uh, the secondary screen is uh, basically a supplemental information for HPI that shows to the clinician what might be causing uh, the hypotension. Because remember, this is a prediction. So everything might look normal, uh, but uh, some parameters may trend towards an abnormal level. Right. So that secondary screen helps uh, cl- clinicians decide whether uh, it's a contractility issue or whether it's a preload issue or afterload issue. So the second, well, I'm just looking over your shoulder. The people listening won't be able to get a great buzz on this, but the, we, there's a, a monitor just being thrown up with a secondary screen on it. And it has the things we're familiar with. It has mean arterial pressure, cardiac out from, cardiac outputs, systemic vascular resistance. At the bottom, it's got three boxes. It's got SVV, it's got DPDT, and EA Dine. Now, Simon, in <laughs> 10 minutes or less, try and get through those three. I'll do the first one if you want. I was well, say, I'll do SVV. <laughs> the easy one. After you. <laughs> a stroke volume variation in a positive, in, under certain conditions, like a positively pressure ventilated patient in sinus rhythm with appropriate sized tidal breaths, the, lung, the air going in and out of the lungs, if the patient is relatively hypovolemic, so preload responsive, causes a variation in stroke volume or pulse pressure. And if that is above a particular magnitude, it implies the fact that they are preload responsive and therefore a fluid bolus is likely to be one of the correct interventions. Correct. Damn it, that's absolutely correct. Ten okay. points, Monty. Thank you. <laughs> right, DPDT and EA done. So oh, you baby. DPDT is a measure of contractility. Um, and the way to think of it is it just quantifies the slope or the upslope on your arterial line. And we're all used to seeing it when we've got a really good strong heart, the arterial waveform shoots up so the pressure change is quite high. It happens in a short period of time. So DP, change of pressure, over DT, change of time, is a high number. So that's good contractility. So the one I'm looking at over your shoulder, the stroke volume variation is 8. So that's yep. sort of threshold where we say, looking at all the other numbers, map looks okay, cardiac output looks good. I don't think they need fluid at the moment. They don't need preload adjusting. Their D- DPDT is 837 at the moment. Is that, is that good, bad, or indifferent? <laughs> I don't know. It's okay. green right now. And so <laughs> it's not a number we really have normalized values for. I think it's a number or a variable that we use in the context of change and trending. But it has, it has next to it 0%, which I presume means it hasn't changed from baseline. So if we thought contractility was okay at the beginning, we think it's okay now. 
Yeah, so that 0% is over the last five minutes. Okay. But mm. you may have started off at induction yeah. or pre-induction being 1,600. Who knows? It might be a fit 21-year-old. Unlikely, but you're absolutely right. It's a number that we look at changing. Trends. So if you start off at 800 and it's now 200, you can be pretty sure contract sales has gone down. Okay, last one, EA Dine, and then we'll throw a few scenarios at you. EA Dine, I don't know what it is. I think I know what it does, though. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, it's not elastance measured in dines, is it? It's not elastance. It's not afterload. It's a made-up number. It's your pulse pressure variation divided by your stroke volume variation. It's expressed as a ratio. It's a ratio, exactly. Okay. And so what it tells us, that if you are preload responsive, so if your SPV is raised, if you increase flow... Yep. by giving some fluid, will that increase in flow increase your blood pressure? Mm. Okay, let's give you a work scenario here. So your stroke volume, very, so your macro numbers are looking okay, but your HPI is rising. Okay, yep. that's what we're going to do here. Your stroke volume variation is 15%. Uh, it, DPDT and EA Dine are normal. Give a bit of fluid. Yeah, your flow responsive. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Now, you, you, the, everything else is looking okay. Uh, HPI is rising. Uh, pressure might be sagging a little bit. Your DPDT has gone down by 30%. If you wanted to treat that with a drug, what sort of drug would you give? Uh, for us, it's ephedrine. A little bit of uh, yeah. inotrope, it's a bit of beta stimulation, improves contractility. That's probably the underlying cause. Right, now let's get the one we have to get your head around it. And that is that you appear to be, your SVV is elevated, so you're preload responsive. And your EA Dyne is... 0.8, which means your pulse pressure variation to stroke volume variation tells us what? It tells us, so in that situation, we want to give fluid because yep. we're flow responsive, Okay. but giving that fluid is not going to increase our blood pressure. Okay. To do that, we have to have a second intervention. Okay, if the EA Dyne was 1.2, then by giving fluid, we're fixing flow and we're going to fix pressure as well. Simple. Done. It is simple. Easy. Right. <laughs> it's only taken me about two years. But we got it. So the, the, the ratio thing. Does that make sense, Desiree? Are we yeah, all over I'm it? Fi- well, I'm, yeah. I, you've had two years on me to figure it out. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it really does. It's starting to make sense. And, you know, if you, have, if you understand kind of the preliminary fa- you know, factors, the yeah. main physiological parameters, I mean, it, to take it a step further is not EA Dawn, it's the stroke volume variation of the pressure world. That's what it is. It's a good way so to if, you, if you visualize it, as, as the air goes in and out of the lungs, as the air goes in, it squirts a little bit of fluid into the heart, so it, is, it does its own little preload. If the pulse pressure goes up and down, and the stroke volume go up and down equally, then the EA Dyne is 1.0. Yeah. yeah. If the stroke volume goes up and down a lot, but the pulse pressure variation doesn't go up and down a lot, you've got a floppy vessel, basically. You've got an old balloon. Yeah, it's yeah. So blown so up a thousand times. You may give the fluid, but the fluid won't produce the pressure. So you need to give fluid and some squeeze. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. And you're, just, you're getting all this information without doing anything. You're just watching the change. <laughs> well, that should appeal to. <laughs> can, you, can you do it without a resident? <laughs> Where um, I work, yes. <laughs> I have two questions. One for for us. What are some of the limitations? I get this question a lot. What are some of the limitations uh, with the HPI? Because you know there are a lot of limitations with SVB in in general. So are they the same with the HPI? Uh, well, let me say first that SVV as a parameter is not part of the HPI. So the limitations okay. of SVV don't go to, the, I mean, don't apply to HPI. Uh, so uh, the only limitation of HPI I could think of is that it, uh, so the algorithm cannot predict uh, uh, maybe uh, hypotension that is caused by some interventions either by the surgeon or the anesthesiologist. Like so, so if if you have situation, for example of clamping a vessel uh, or, or, you know, major bleeding or something like that that is caused by the surgeon, uh, that is not going to be predicted by HPI. However, it's going to be still detected. Right. And maybe talked about the other yeah. days, it can't predict, oops. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> you can't. Yeah. No, we can go down one, the can predict that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Simon, I have a question for you. Um, you talked about you were adopting this very quickly. Um, I mean, I feel like when we bring in new technology, I mean, that is the first thing we always say. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I believe it. This is, you know, a random number generator or whatever. Um, what, it, what was the learning curve like for this? And in about how many cases were you kind of convinced that this was something that you thought would be valuable? I think the learning curve is ongoing. 
um, just now looking at HPI Beyond being just a mark of hypotension. But in terms of the early stages, I think for me, it was 20, 30 cases before I had you know, before we had to face for the deceit for me yeah. and I had confidence into it. So, well, when we talk about adoption of it, you just have to manage those expectations. Yeah. You're not going to roll something like this into the OR and say, oh, today, you know, I, after two cases, I, it should be able to work for Technology me. Technology often tells us what we know, right. but it also frequently tells us what we don't know. It doesn't always wow you, yep. but it adds incremental value to your, to your practice. Uh, but you have to learn to trust it. Yeah. I think that's the important thing. Now, people are chomping at the bit to have a go. And I think very responsibly, because everyone's kind of, you know, we are who we are. We want to have a go. Yeah. <laughs> and the company, I think, very responsibly has done a very controlled release. Because I think we're all mindful of this. You know, there's quite a lot of education to be done. Yeah. We do also need to learn by doing. But we need to educate ourselves to understand, you know, on the screen, again, the people here can have a look at it. It looks like a physiological variable. Mm. So we're at risk of treating it like a physiological variable. What can I do to make the HPI go up would be the first <laughs> instinct. <laughs> yeah. Because you know, maybe it looks like a saturation, whereas that's not the objective, is it? It's, it's, it's not it, a number you treat, is it? It's, 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 it's a warning. warning. Yeah. Okay, that's, and that's going to take us a while. Because you can make it go up and down by doing things, can't you? Oh, you can. You can You can aim for a HPI of one all the way through if you want. <laughs> um, might not be the best thing to do, though. And you can get it close <laughs> to zero by doing the wrong thing as well, can't Very you? much so. Yeah. yeah. So that's going to be part of the education journey and that is key i think yeah absolutely well any any final thoughts words of of wisdom or words to to take home for people that are when they start looking at this technology Uh, i I think as as you were saying before that's right we just have to embrace this and we have to work with industry because they can provide lots of things that help us care for our patients but we have to engage with them and we have to engage with technology learn to understand it learn where it fits into our practice uh, and more importantly learn how to use it appropriately yeah and it's going to be the f- it's one of the first in a rapidly emerging field I mean it, you know, for us this team have worked really hard to get us here it's been a very heavy lift but already people are understandably saying can we customise HPI can we add different variables to it can we watch it? I mean I know you've got a big team now working really hard but this is difficult stuff and, and the uh, you know the more we race at it the more we potentially screw things up the harder we'll make that journey (laughs) so we've got to work together which we are in success yes and this is just the first generation of uh, predictive analytics type of products and uh, of course we are already working on the next generation's uh, products of course along with clinicians uh, collaborating on on, developing these technologies yeah that's fantastic well gentlemen thank you so much for sitting down with us here on Top Med Talk um, here in at EBHM 2019 in the exhibit area. We look forward, Simon, to your presentation later today, uh, hearing Beautiful. more about that. And uh, be sure to check out uh, the, the Top Med Talks that we've done with Simon and Faraz on topmedtalk.com. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank Cheers. You. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Top Med Talk. Nate Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out topmedtalk.com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.